So on this week's episode of Be More Super, the podcast, we've got another great guest from Warrior Nun. It's the visual effects supervisor, Michael Blackbourne. Michael, welcome to the show, sir. Hey, how's it going? Do you know what? It's going great. Did you have a good holiday? Uh, yeah, it was a good holiday. Um, it was a little relaxing. Uh, we're just starting on some new big work for Disney and Paramount. And so uh, we're getting into that now and we're going to have a busy, uh, busy spring. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's fine. It's good. And um, I'm doing the work mostly from home. So, you yeah, know, like we've been doing for the last two years. So. I mean, obviously, we've got you on this show to celebrate the wonderful work uh, that was done on Warrior Nun, uh, which we've had an amazing two seasons. Sadly, it got cancelled by Netflix. But looking at the news and everything like that, they they seem to be cancelling literally every show after season one, especially with 1866 that they've just cancelled as well. Um, the fans... I've got to give a shout out. The fans have been absolutely amazing. And I've got to say a massive congratulations. As you can see on screen there, uh, this show, Warrior Nun, is being given like the highest rated uh, show on Netflix uh, by Rotten Tomatoes, 100% uh, critics and 99%, um, you know, the audience. I mean, how proud are you to be part of this Warrior Nun journey and have this amount of positive feedback for this amazing show yeah i mean we've i've worked on a few projects that kind of um you know you didn't know when you were working on them how much how how they'd kind of turn out as far as like impact and sort of uh fan excitement um and you know we knew that when we were working on season one of warrior nun it was it was a fun you know show with you know uh funny magic and you know uh, good fight scenes and things mm. um done by simon barry who he's a great creative guy to work for um but you know I, a lot of his experience comes from doing like vancouver vancouver shows you know uh, continuum and things and so you know we kind of were like okay it's a vancouver show shot in spain okay you know and and but it it came together as a, a lot more than the sum of its parts, I think. And season two, everything kind of, you know, all the, the writing was, was nice and sharp and the, uh, the acting and fight scenes and everything sort of um, came together really well. And, and it's really cool to see sort of the fan um, numbers and interest both on Twitter and on YouTube with like reaction videos and stuff. And uh and on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, I think, you know, Iron Man was totally like that. We, we were working on Iron Man and we didn't really realize at the time that we were kicking off the whole MCU, right? Like, like we, we did the Mark One suit stepping out of the cave and we we're like, okay, that's cool. We did a robot suit for a superhero movie. And then we kind of realized later, oh, okay, cool. That's, that's the first Iron Man suit ever. And Iron Man's a big thing. Same with District 9 and a few other things, you know, mm. like Hunger Games. We, we've done some bigger stuff. But, um, but yeah, Warrior Nun, Warrior Nun was, a, was a pleasant surprise at how, how the whole thing kind of came together and how, mm. um, how well all the fans reacted to it. So, yeah, no, uh, at the time we didn't really know that that's what we were working on. But mm. it's, it's, it's awesome to sort of see um, how much people have taken the show on um, – for themselves for for mm. you know for their for what they like and uh, what they've been sharing and all the fan artwork and all the things so yeah well Very at the cool. end at the end at the, the end of the day all the filmmakers and the act the, the actors they they work at this job for the audience at the end the end of the day so you know the way i look at it is that warrior nun is like a you know it's a perfect dish it's got all the correct ingredients quality you know and it was presented to to, to us but hopefully fingers crossed um you know i know science si- simon's been speaking with other streaming platforms with the possibility of the show getting picked up and if I'm right in saying it's had over 5 million tweets now for Save Warrior None. So, you know, the fans are doing a great job, uh, but I think we need to also celebrate the fact that we've had two great seasons, which I think is great. Yeah. Um, I It's one of those things where I don't really understand how shows get greenlit. I don't mm. really understand how they get cancelled, and I don't really understand how they get saved with this kind of fan interest, right? Mm. So, you know, if if we get to do a season three, I'm I'm super excited and I'm on board. Um, hmm. 
I'm sure that, you know, there's all kinds of cool stuff we can do with the ideas and characters and creatures we already have. And I'm sure that the writers will come up with all kinds of mm-hmm. other wacky stuff for us to do, which, you know, I'm, I'm fully on board with. Um, but yeah, as far as, as far as, um, whether or not that happens, I, I, I hope so, but I, I have no idea. Right. Cause I, mm-hmm. I don't really know, you know, how it, uh, why, why it would have gotten canceled in the first place. You know, I'm mm-hmm. sure that the, uh, the math and the numbers and everything's was telling somebody that, you know, um, I guess two seasons was enough, but, uh, but hopefully the fan mm. reactions change that. I don't know. Yeah. But this is, but this is what puts, puts me off, uh, watching certain shows because if it's not a limited series, you know, you're going to be left with a cliffhanger. So there are shows like 1899 that I haven't watched yet, which I'm thinking now, you know, do I want to watch it? Because, it's been cancelled so do i want to invest all that time and and you know into that show and then be left with a potential cliffhanger so uh but before we go into worrying on more in detail i want to find out more about you michael because because your industry always fascinates me because i i consider myself as a technical person um but for the love of money i cannot get my head around adobe after effects or any software so the fact that you can do your magic on screen i just think is magical so so what got you into this industry of visual effects what was that catalyst that that drove that passion um that's a good question uh i think that um in high school i i can draw pretty well somewhat Anyway, I could, I've always been, been able to express myself visually uh, with a pencil and you know, painting and that kind of thing. And I've always been into techie stuff and computers and, you know, Photoshop and stuff. And so at the end of high school, I started researching, you know, um, how to do some stuff with 3D things and, and that kind of stuff. But I hadn't, and I was always into like animation and, and anime and, and, you know, whatever, a whole bunch of different things, right? Um, but... I couldn't really figure out how to make a career out of that or what direction to really take. And so I followed my other passions that I had, which was sort of um, outdoor camping, martial arts, rock climbing kind of stuff. And I actually ended up in, in the Airborne Infantry for six years. Wow. So, so I did a small career in the Army. And, you know, I was stationed in Italy in, and uh, and it was a good experience. It was in between 96 and 94 to 2000. The, you know, the world was a relatively peaceful place at the time. And, you know, luckily I didn't have to, uh, have to go anywhere too dangerous at the time. We were in Kosovo briefly, but, um, but yeah, I, about halfway through my stint in the army, I realized I didn't want to get to be 40 and be sleeping in a puddle. And so I decided that um, I'd follow my other passions, my other talents. And so um, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, had been going to like animation school in Vancouver. And I thought, well, 3D animation and filmmaking kind of stuff, that, that's probably a better route to sort of take. And so I sort of um, steered my way into that. And so once I got out of the army, I came back to Vancouver and um, and took a two year course in animation. And I've been working either in um, video games, television or film ever since. And then I actually started at the embassy, which is where I work now uh, in 2006. So I've, I've been with the company for a long time. And yeah, we did Iron Man and we did, we did Hunger Games and District 9 and all this stuff. Um, the software part of it, um, the software is complex and, and it needs to be to do all the things it needs to do. Because at this point, people can imagine anything and mm-hmm. then you, try to, you need to make it try to happen. Um, but um, as far as our tools go, you know, we, we, use, a, we use a small set of tools we use maya and houdini and nuke um i'm sorry no after effects but uh <laughs> but yeah um but yeah and, and we've been using these tools um to do all our work for for many years now and um and we sort of apply the same 
set of tools and talents to everything we work on, whether we're working on commercials or whether we're working on um, films or TV. Um, during the start of the pandemic, we actually got very busy because we all went remote. We had just finished, we just finished season, we finished season one of Warrior Done remotely, the last couple shots, beheading the Tarask, uh, uh at the end of season one. Um, and then people were watching more TV than ever, but everyone was trapped at home and nobody could go film anything. And so we actually got really busy doing commercials. And so we did a whole bunch of like all CG, all 3D commercials for, for a variety of products um, during that time, which was great um, because we're all being kept busy and we're all safe at home. And so, you know, that worked out very well. Um, the studio, um, the embassy gratefully invested a lot of time and money in, into the technology of us working remotely. And mm. now that we've done that for two and a half years, we're good at it enough that we've embraced it as our main way to work. And so we now use it as a recruiting um, draw so mm. that, you know, hey, you want to come work at the studio? Great. You can come into the studio and there's machines there. You want to work at home? Work how you want. You know, um, we've gotten really good at working remotely. And so we're going to keep it up because it's a, it's a huge plus and we can hire people from further afield. So. And of course, that talent pool is now the world because obviously if you can do remote, you can get anyone around the globe to work for the embassy, which yeah. I've got to say, well, yeah, I, I mean, I've got to say the embassy does sound like a secret organization, to be fair, the name, but you celebrated 20 years of the com company re re recently as well. Um, so how did the embassy and yourself get involved with Warrior Nun? Uh, was it a case of uh, the project come came to your desk uh, i mean how how did that 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 all work with the involvement simon berry and uh, winston helgeson are friends and winston's our president and and main owner um they they've been like looking for projects to work on together for a while i think because again simon makes fantastical shows mm -hmm. and we work on tv shows and film um i just don't think it had ever come together before and then, and then it worked out well for Warrior Nun. Um, I think the other thing was that, if I remember correctly, um, we were part of the pitch for Warrior Nun to Netflix because we had worked on uh, Lost in Space. And so I think Netflix had had experience working with us and they were signing on to do this show with Simon. And I think we came as part of the package so that... Mm. Um, that they knew that they were going to be working with with a visual effects house that they had had experience with before. Mm. So I think that's how that came about. And then obviously, you know, you, you take the reins as the visual effects supervisor. So all, for all the, 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 the viewers and listeners that may not know what that involves, what does that involve being, uh, you know, a visual effects supervisor? Um, I mean, it, it comes down to I'm trying to bring the the creative vision of the director or showrunner to the screen. Um, and, and it, I, my responsibility is everything that they can't go get in camera, right? Because, um, there's so much stuff that, that either can't, can't really exist or, or, or looks pretty ridiculous if you put a guy in a suit or, or just to call, or just takes way too much time to film, right? Like the, the the setup time and having everybody on set is so expensive that anything that you can kind of move to visual effects, you try to do because um, because the the time cost of spending more time on set is so high <clears throat> that mm. you know if you can do simple things like painting out stunt mats or getting rid of um, um, you know, tape marks on the floor or and we do we do all kinds of visual effects that had, that aren't even that interesting right like uh they'll they'll film a scene a couple times and they'll like one actor's take from one or one actor's reaction from one take and one actor's reaction from another take and it works better combining the two takes and so we'll end up doing a split screen of of two different takes together <clears throat> to basically take the best reactions and things like all all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff right and so but yeah, my, my responsibility is everything that they can't get in camera uh, comes down to me to, to make sure um, gets pulled off realistically and, and, and meets the sort of um, story that they want to tell. Mm. And that involves the planning for the shoots, that involves either being at the shoots. Um, for Warrior Nun, we had, we had um, 
we sent one of one of our guys and we actually hired like the shoe went on long enough in Spain that we actually hired like a local um, on set supervisor that that was there on set. And then I would be reviewing all the dailies that they would shoot. I'd be reviewing the data getting sent back from set. And then I have to handle all of the the visual effects post work um, from getting the edits and footage to getting it all out the door um, at the end. And I'm not completely responsible for like um, the, the schedule time or money parts of it. Mm-hmm. My role, ideally, I mean, I end up, I end up responsible for like meeting schedules, but um, <clears throat> I, my primary role is to creatively pull off what it is that uh, the showrunner or directors are looking for. And so I would be in a weekly call with Simon going over the work and making adjustments and, uh, and trying to, trying to tell the story he wants to tell. Awesome. I mean, you've worked on so many big budget projects. So was there any sacrifices made when coming on to worry and none in the way, you know, of budget or, or what you could do on screen compared to say like Iron Man, which must have had a massive Uh, budget. No, I, I think every single project's kind of the same in that way, which is that um, the budgets are are set very early on in like bids. Like you, you'll 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 bid it out based on a script. Um, we'll we'll bid it out based on a script. Uh, like there'll be a line that says, you know, the the you know whatever Michael explodes in a blue glow, right? Which is at the end of at the end of season two there. And you're like, okay, great. How many days is that going to be for somebody to work on? And you're like, I don't know. Um, it'll take somebody five days working in an effects package to get to something or eight days or something, right? You'll come up with a number that you, that feels comfortable. And then all those numbers go into a spreadsheet and get multiplied by the number of shots. And it turns into this, this, this math equation. And in the end it costs whatever million dollars. And then, and then Netflix goes, well, we don't have that. And you're like, well, great, we'll do it for (coughs) two thirds of that. Mm. And then they're like, okay, I guess we can live with that. And then, and then you have to then, then make that work. And every single project is the same. You, you bid it out you find something that everyone's kind of comfortable with or fits within the budget. And then you try to make it work for that. And it was no different on Iron Man than it was for, for, um, warrior nun or lost in space or district nine mm-hmm. or any of these things. Um, for, for warrior nun, one thing that was different was, um, because I was the visual effects supervisor for the show and I was talking directly to Simon, we weren't like a separate vendor working for another visual effects supervisor. We, we kind of had one less middleman mm. than say on like Lost in Space, we were just one of a few vendors. And so I would have been the studio supervisor working for the show visual effects supervisor. And so there's, there's sort of another person between yourself and the, the creative um the, the person telling the story, the showrunner or director. Mm. And so with, with um, Warrior Nun, that person wasn't really there. I was working directly with Simon. And so very often I would just, there was a lot of trust there where um, we'd put something together and, and take it all the way till kind of, you know, it looked finished-ish. I presented to Simon be like, this is what we're proposing for, you know, how, uh, how a Tarrasque fights three wraith demons, right? Like nobody knew what that was going to look like. Like, oh, great. We're, we're filming, we're filming a plate and you know, the Tarrasque's fighting wraith demons. Cool. And they do the best they can with, with being there on set and then in the edits and making it feel like there's enough time, but not too much time. We, we animated all that stuff, presented it to him, um, you know, very often the the trust was there enough that we got very few notes from Simon and then it went off to Netflix and we got very few notes from Netflix. So I think that, um, that might be the one difference is because there's one less sort of level of approval between things, things went pretty smoothly and, and Simon is really into letting us express ourselves create creatively and, um, treats it more like he's, conducting a symphony orchestra rather Mm. than rather than trying to micromanage every small detail um and so as long as we 
brings something cool to the table that f that doesn't go against his idea of, of how how the magic should work. Um, he would he would he would be on board um, because a lot of the stuff he doesn't have figured out, right? Like he he doesn't try when when putting when putting um, the words to the page initially to to try to have it so clear in his head that that he'll feel disappointed if he doesn't get every little thing, right? He, he mm -hmm. I think he stays flexible. And I think that's wise because you, you can't ever get any, everything that you want. And yeah. you do want to be open to having other people. Like he's not going to always have like the best ideas for absolutely everything, right? He knows that. And so he's really into having everybody else bring their ideas to the table and being open to it. And so I think that makes the process go smoothly too because he, he doesn't try to... Um, control every last pixel all the way down right he's not interested in that he he wants mm -hmm. us to be artists so which yeah. is great and that's the best way to get the best out of p people is is let them do what they do best and you know encourage that um so with 684 visual effects shots you know which ones were the most challenging <clears throat> for your for you and your team to work on that's a interesting number i don't know where that's from um season one was 600 and season two was 800 so, oh right okay so this but, this but, this but was sure, from that, an article you, you, you got a six and an eight in there so close enough yeah. but um yeah um oh i don't know um for season two probably the big lilith fight at the end of episode one where she rips up all those guys um that that had some of the, the, the biggest planning. Um, it had this this robot camera that you had to program um, the moves on, um, so that it, the move, the camera move, could be repeated again and again and again. And then they sh they had um, the actors and stunt people um, take up all the different positions, so that uh, Lilith could could be shot in different locations, so that she could teleport around, phase around. Um, the that shot went on forever and it was so long and it was done with 13 different passes i think of the camera all and we had to like cut out people from each pass and stitch it all together and then keep track of all the bodies on the floor and where the blood pools were building up and things so that shot was the hardest shot of the season for sure but but it was it was on purpose right they said let's let's end episode one with a big bang so that we can kind of bring people into season two sort of with the right energy. And also I think uh, sort of as have some foreshadowing for maybe the monster arc that Lilith was going to go on for the season. Mm. So yeah. that for sure was, was, was the hardest shot of the season. Um, but then, then there'll be other weird small things that were way harder than other stuff. Like we'll have shots with six Tarasks at the end stomping around ripping adriel up that were easier than getting that crown of thorns to to stick to ava's head in some shots because getting cg objects to stick to people is is challenging sometimes and especially there's there's one shot where it's in slow motion where her head like lolls back and then rocks forward and then i think vincent picks her up and carries her away and uh getting the crown to stick properly and not slip in that shot was was surprisingly hard and so you know um so yeah there'd be surprisingly simple things that were difficult and then big complicated things that you knew were going to be difficult that were mm. difficult but yeah yeah i mean i mean my favorite scene was the one with lilith you know um where she's fight she's fighting with in the catacombs uh, i just thought it was just yeah, ama that, amazing it reminded me a lot yeah. of um x-men you know the nightcrawler where he's going like sort of his right. teleport yeah, yeah. Port, port, and it was just amazing i just thought it was just done so so well it just was jaw dropping um yeah there was some neat stuff in there where where the camera move the, the rope the, the robotic camera move that they had put in worked pretty well but but it started to move to like the next position mm. before well before Lilith would arrive there, right? Because I had to get down to the other end. And so we actually we actually came up with um, the idea that maybe Lilith's not just phasing out and phasing in. We actually introduced, to make that make sense, um, sort of a, a partial phasing 
thing where where she, you sort of got like a it's a, kind of like an after image of her mm. moving through the space before um before she'd arrive to the next location to help lead the camera around right mm. and that's kind of the thing where again we're not we're not phoning up simon being like hey we want to change how the phasing magic works because because the, the camera is kind of um driving around without anything motivating it that's the kind of thing where he just trusts us to like go make it cool, make it all work. And, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing that we, we sort of put in there. And as long as it doesn't butt up against his idea of how, how the magic works, he, he just looks at it and went, Oh, that's, that's cool. Great. You know, the, (laughs) the camera makes total sense now it's, it's filming her teleporting down across anyway. So that's the kind of thing where, where, you know, we're just, we're just coming up with that stuff and mm. and then we sell it to simon and and then it makes it way into the show so yeah. i mean would you say michael you're a perfectionist in in no in your job? no 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 i'm i'm a i'm a pragmatic i'm a very just pragmatic person um uh not at all uh you can't be a perfectionist in this business i don't think because you you always run out of time and money every mm. like the, the, you will you will never be satisfied if you're a perfectionist because because you you get it as good as you can, and then you run out of time and have to work on something else, and then you run out of time on that, and then and then it has to air, mm-hmm. and that's it. And you 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 will always run out of time and money, um, and people, and 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 iterations, and and second chances. So if you're a perfectionist, you're setting yourself up for a career of disappointment. I think because you will never make it perfect because. The goal is subjective. Nobody knows mm-hmm. what what uh, what you know. Michael's body being infused with halo energy, overcharging and having exploding divinium go everywhere looks like. Mm-hmm. And so and so you know you just you just have to you just have to sort of start going down the path and continually reevaluating kind of what you're doing, where you're at how much time you have left and where you can go. And as long as you don't waste a bunch of time going down sort of um, paths that don't lead anywhere, usually you end up, you know, in a, in a, in a place that everyone looks at and goes, wow, that's cool. And you know, it, it, it works. But as far as perfection goes, no, you can't, you can't because mm-hmm. nothing, you always run out of time and money and energy. It's, it's, it's just the nature of what you're doing. So. And is there anything that you would like to go back and, and maybe tweak or change? Or are you completely happy with the end result? No, no, I'm super happy with the end result. Um, the, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have let it out of the building if, if I wasn't happy with the end result. Um, you know, you could have always done more or something different or whatever, but, but it, I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have approved it if, if it if it was something that I felt like we needed to go back to. Um, you know, the, I was, we were finishing the show at the end of August and start of September this, mm. uh, whatever, I guess last year now, um, 2022. And, and, you know, um, I have like a, a 4k TV monitor here that I was reviewing all the work on. And, um, and it's funny because we charge ahead so fast with trying to get the storytelling parts perfect. I guess not perfect. Um, excellent. Um, so like I was, I was reviewing, um, all the stuff from episode 10 with the Trasks, um, in there. And in hindsight, the things that I was catching in the last like two weeks, right before we were done, um, was stuff that wasn't even really like big marquee visual effects stuff. I was finding, I found like a Tupperware lid from a bin, um sitting on the floor underneath the 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 portal machine the arc the arc machine and the very last shot or it's was it second or third to last shot with with um uh, uh beatrice sitting there after after ava's gone and lilith's gone and she's kind of just sort of um has this kind of like sort of resolve as to like what's next mm. you know um and and as the camera pulls back this nice long slow shot there was this goofy tupperware bin from like a lid for probably some cables or something that was sitting in a like a little trench underneath the 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 portal and so i had to get that painted out right like like last minute like stuff like that um but you know um 
as far as wanting to go back and change stuff, no, I don't think so. Um, I know a fan found a cameraman in one shot. Um, <laughs> there's some fight scene that doesn't even have visual effects in it. And and I guess somebody missed it spotting that there was a frame or two of the elbow of some other cameraman that crept, creeps into a shot. So, you know, sure, I'd like to go back and fix that for sure. But uh, but no, as far as as far as like the storytelling and 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 all of our contribution to the narrative and everything, no, I, there's nothing I'd want to change. Um, you know, uh, yeah, if we go back and find a few more like bits of tape on the floor and uh, and you know uh, cameraman elbows and reflections of microphones in that glass wall in Jillian's where Jillian's house was stuff like that. Sure. I'd, I'd love to go back to do some of that stuff, but you know, that's no, it. No. Every, 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 everyone's going to be checking that out now. Um, well, everyone, you know. does, everyone does anyway. Everyone does anyway. I mean, like that's when we were working on the wings, mm. when the wings opened, um, you know, it was quite a bit of work to make them feel like how everyone expects wings to look. And mm. so I, I actually, I actually was kind of, kind of a perfectionist on the, the sort of like arches on the bottoms of the wings. I kind of wanted them to be sort of like how you would draw them, how mm. everyone expects them to kind of look. And cause like when, 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 how they're rigged and everything, they wouldn't always come out looking kind of as nice as, as one would want if you sat there and drew wings on somebody. Mm. And so that I knew those wings were going to get like screen grabbed and be, put on stuff and be used for promotional things and for people sharing stuff on Twitter and whatever. And so I kind of went back on the animators a few times on trying to like make sure those arches actually like were, were, were even and pleasant because I knew that they'd show up in stills all over the place. So that, that is the kind of thing that you have to think about when you're working on this stuff is that people are going to mine every frame of the show for stuff and you kind of don't want to let stuff slip through. So mm -hmm. I mean the scene with a Adriel where the wings go round him, I just think's magical. I think it's awesome. Yeah. Uh, that was so... a cool. That was a cool way to introduce them to have them like come out with all the embers and the smoke and then mm. kind of like wrap wrap around them. Yeah, that was cool. I mean, do you what what what's your view on too much CGI and too much visual effects? Is there such thing as putting too much in? generally in the industry do you find that there are films out there or tv shows that you think do you know what that's got way too much C C C cgi in it um no i don't think so um i think that if you want to see all the crazy stories that people can tell now right like if you want to see mm. all this insane stories that that are cap that are possible now you you have to do it in a way that is conscious of time and budget and money and and the trying to build trying to blow up miniatures or something and then you can only blow it up once and then it it either doesn't look great or you have to spend so much time and energy building five of them so you can blow mm -hmm. them up five times and then resetting the camera and all these things like like it it's very expensive to take up all of the time and money of everybody on set. And, and especially when you're trying to do everything with practical effects, mm -hmm. with special effects, right? Where you're using demolitions and, and all these things. Um, you resetting is, a, is, is almost impossible. Um, you know, getting all, getting actors on, on wires very often looks like it's like Mary Poppins on wires still, unless you're going to put tons of time and energy into it, which is like what they did on uh, gravity. They had um, Sandra Bullock on like a robot arm Mm. being puppeteered using using a super expensive like um the, the the kind of machines that used to like build cars they had her like hooked up on one of those to, like puppeteer her properly and all this stuff but unless you can uh, you can like like a show like warrior and could never get made if you had to take lilith and attach her to a uh, to to two different car robot arms right and and take all mm. that time you, you just couldn't make the show so so no i think i think I think as long as people have a good eye for what they're doing and aim at a good, like realistic target and, and, you know, it, it lets, it lets these creative people, the storyteller, like the showrunners and the directors tell fantastical stories that, that are just impossible to tell otherwise. Mm. I mean, if you're talking about less visual effects, I mean, we would never had lightsabers and star destroyers that's visual effects right it's a miniature exactly. but it's still yeah. it's still getting optically composited back in right and if you looked at the original return of the jedis and stuff there's edges all over the place and it's kind of there's some goofy cops in there right it's still an awesome movie 
but the compositing and everything can be a lot you can you can spend way more time finessing all the edges and everything you know mm -hmm. now in in digitally um so no um i think there is a little bit of a weird thing where where if you're watching you know the latest big marvel film sometimes it feels like you're just watching um everything being digital but that's 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 choices being made by by you know by the ambitions of the studio right you want you want 20,000 aliens running across the african tundra towards in black panther or in or in um or in uh avengers it's it's going to look like 10,000 alien thing like i don't know it's it's hard to make that stuff look realistic because i think mm. i think we don't have a we don't have a very good basis for seeing 10,000 aliens running across, you know, a landscape shooting purple lasers. I, th I think that always mm -hmm. looks weird because you know that it's nobody went out and filmed that. So, yeah, I mean, you know. I mean, you're right in 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 saying that they're, they're becoming a lot more ambitious now. So it's not like say like Aliens, where it was a, a lot of um, you know um, made suits and and the special effects were awesome as well. Um, but again, I suppose these Mar Marvel movies now, yeah, they demand 2,000 a a a aliens running. And obviously you can't do that in the real world. Um, but I want to talk about tech now because it's always interesting. I mean, what sort of computers uh, do you guys use for this? Is it PC? Is it Mac? Um, you know, how powerful are your computers? Aliens have visual effects. All the spaceships. All the spaceships are visual effects. All the little flying, the flying uh, miniature of the of the the thing. That's all visual yeah. effects. I mean, I mean, and then yeah, the alien themselves was like a guy in a suit jumping around in the dark, and you barely <laughs> saw them, right? So that is true. other than the queen at the end, the queen at the end is pretty pretty cool. Um, the uh, the computers they're just they're they're just normal. They're like like most most decent PCs these days have enough horsepower to do this stuff. Um, so they're just they're just normal workstations. We we they run Linux operating system on them all, um, and and we sort of have a a pipeline built up um, over the years, which is basically sort of like a a database structure that manages version control and and uh, naming of things and locations of stuff. So the artists mm -hmm. aren't hunting around. We we try to save the artist time from like hunting around in the file system and and naming stuff by hand and you know um wondering what's the right version of what to use so we we control that with a database so that you know um if somebody publishes the latest animation for something somebody who works downstream of them to do lighting can just can just say get the latest whatever and it updates in their scene so um mm -hmm. but it but the the magic sauce is that i think um the sort of pipeline we've set up to control data flow more than the the actual hardware or or even the software we're using to do the work um mm. controlling controlling the information and making sure that revising it is easy i think is is the key thing because you you want to be as flexible as you can as long as possible um mm. you know you you can't quite if you're a bit careful like if you're if you're, you're finishing a whole bunch of shots and somebody says well we want to change how big the Tarrasque is or something. You're like, kind of like, well, you know, it would have been nice to hear that <laughs> early on rather than now. <laughs> um, so not everything's flexible all the way through, but yeah, you, you do want to stay as flexible as you can because everyone does know it's in the computer mm. and you may get sort of weird last minute requests that want changes. And so you need to make sure that you can kind of fold that stuff in without being like, nope, the concrete set on the foundation can't change it. I mean, they, they know you can. And so you have to be somewhat flexible for that stuff. Mm. Um, you know, uh, sometimes you wish clients, not saying that this applies to warrior, not necessarily, but, um, some clients, um, feel like everything should be changeable all the way to the last minute. And, and, and it is, but then it affects the quality because if you're if you're changing a whole bunch of stuff last minute, then you know, um, then you're going to spend less time polishing it, and mm -hmm. that's just the nature of of how that works. You know, you can't have 
there's only so much time and resources. So, you know, you want to, you want to change the last minute? Well, then we're redoing stuff and we can't polish it as much. And so, yeah. <laughs> you can like sacrifice it. I mean, yeah, yeah. If, if, if someone wanted to uh, follow in your fo footsteps and get into sort of vis visual effects, what are the first steps would you recommend them doing to potentially get into this industry? Um, when we're hiring people, the biggest thing I look for is creativity because I think you can teach people how to use software. You can teach people um, how to hit production deadlines and um, how to how to revise their work and how to how to sort of do the nuts and bolts visual effects work of like getting in the footage and you know getting a camera track and working within that and all the all the various things. The thing that's kind of hard to teach anybody is is sort of creativity and so. Mm. If, if they're, if they want to be in the industry, um, trying to make sure that they, they don't get lost in the, they, they don't lose, they don't forget the point of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, because the point of what you're doing is to like, is to tell stories. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, whether you're doing animation or lighting or, or effects where you're like blowing something up or whatever it is you're trying to learn or compositing where you're, where you're trying to like, um, to the to the glows and the magic and the and and um, you know work on green screens and all the all the various things. The point of what you're doing is to tell stories, and so if if somebody wants a job and they show up and it's clear that they have that little bit of spark of creativity, um, then then you can teach them other things. Mm -hmm. But if they aren't, if they haven't honed their ability to like be creative and and you know tell stories however small or limited or or partial um it it you end up with kind of like life lifeless technicians and that's not really what any of us want to do we all want to mm. we all want to express ourselves creatively 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 <laughs> creatively and tell stories and um and so, yeah, that's that's what I'm looking for in people is is people that are are creative and want to sort of put their own energy into what they're working on mm. so. i mean if you had a chance to work on any movie past or present that may be coming out uh what what past what would that present. be yeah ouch past or present um i'm, I'm allowed to time travel to do of course this you are. yeah, of course yeah you are, cool yeah. um it would have been cool to be part of of either like 2001 or the original star wars episode four like that, that's just some marquee stuff that, you know, um, isn't going to happen again to that level. Like that was mm -hmm. such a jump in technology and, and the work, um, that I think that would have been really cool to be part of. Um, I think I have to be very fortunate that we got to be part of Iron Man cause that's such a big thing now that, that, you know, um, that we got to be part of that I think is, is pretty cool. Um, Trying to think if there's anything else that, you know, I don't know. I like watching movies. When you work on them, you you have a very different, <laughs> like you have a very different feel because a lot of times you'll work on like a sequence for six months or eight months or something and then it goes by in like a minute on screen. Mm. And so, <clears throat> so, you know, as far as like reaching back and wanting to have been part of some of these other movies, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, was you was you involved with the Justice League? No. Okay, brilliant. <clears throat> so I'm going to put up a picture. <laughs> Just wanted to check because this picture Peacemaker, here. Peacemaker, though, I loved. I, I loved Peacemaker. When, when, oh, that's like, fantastic! That, that, that latest thing, fantastic, oh, absolutely oh, brilliant. fantastic. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, what are we? What I mean, are we doing here? I mean, obviously, Henry Cavill uh, was filming. Um, I think Mission Impossible, and it had to come back when um, Zack Snyder had to leave and Josh uh, took over. And this has been over the internet. It's been trending. The fact that they had to CGI his mouth and everything like that. I mean, you know, could you go back and fix that? Or <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. You know, the working around production limitations is 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 part of the job, right? Mm. Um, actors aren't available 
actors are missing parts of their costume. Um, you know, the makeup's different, or it was different for one shot, and then and then there was a continuity issue, and it got left in, and you had to paint it out or something. Like mm. working around production issues happens all the time, and you know, it was one of these things where they decided to make the Snyder cut of stuff, mm. and 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 somebody decided to put money and energy into that. But it's not infinite money or energy, and so you know um, the decision was made whether whether being able to do it at all to some level was better than mm. not being able to do it. And you know they decided that that they wanted to serve what the fans wanted and try to tell the story, mm. and they did. And I don't, I wouldn't fault the work. I don't think um, because you you don't really under, know what the constraints were, right? Because mm. if Someone, of course, someone, someone could go back and do a better job of everything. Someone could go back and do a better job yeah. of, of aliens. Somebody could go mm. back and do a better job of, of, of Star Wars, right? Like, uh, I mean, George Lucas has gone back mm. and dabbled with yeah. it, right? To, yeah. to varying levels of success. Mm. Um, I mean, I think the point so, I'm, so I'm every, trying to make yeah. is that with Josh, when he took over, uh, he changed Zack's story completely uh, for Justice League. Uh, this is before the Zack Snyder's Snyder, Snyder cut. So, from a visual effects, you know, company, you know, you've got an actor that's come back uh, because Josh has said, right, we're going to reshoot it. We need to do some other shots, sure. and obviously, he's got a big mustache. Are you in a place where you can actually turn around and say, do you know what? We could do it, but it's not going to be fantastic. I mean, you know, yeah, can you say sure, that? Sure, but you have, but you have to remember that there's enough momentum carrying the so I, I guess what are you saying like like don't do it at all because all, all you're really saying by by saying mm. like you know what there's already all this momentum of we're going to get him back and we're going to do this and we need to paint out the mustache or recreate his face or whatever they yeah. did um there's already enough momentum in that that if if the studio that that made that choice that you're saying that said you know what we could do it but it's going to look terrible mm. somebody else is going to do it Right. Yeah, I suppose so. Right. Yeah. So, 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 so either you take it on and do the best job you can. You say, you know what, we can't do this to the level that we would be happy with. Give it to somebody else, and we've done that with projects as well, right? Um, and and then somebody else will pick it up and do it. But but either either it would get done, and you get your Snyder cut or it wouldn't get done, and there's no Snyder cut. And so mm. I don't know which one the fans would prefer. Mm. right i mean i mean that's that's kind of the you can't it will only ever get done to a certain level probably mm. and and if somebody passes on it and there's enough momentum to to try to tell this story to to get the fans what they want then then somebody's going to do the work and so you know um mm. i mean what I do you know. think i mean what do you think the future is of visual effects i mean you know, where do you see this industry in 10, 20 years time with technology being, being the way it is? I, it's hard to say. I think that, you know, more and more content is getting made everywhere now. Mm. Um, and, and every one of these separate uh, streaming services slash studios now wants to make their own um, stuff ownership to help draw people to their service. Mm. So I think that I think that the industry will just grow. It'll continue to grow, and and um, there'll be there'll be more people telling bigger, crazier stories, and 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 more of it will become possible because you can you can shorten shoot days a little bit. You can mm. you can fix stuff in post you could have never fit fixed before. Um, like even on Warrior on season two, there's there's tons of shots. Not tons. There's quite a few shots in there with with uh, digital actors. Mm. Um, we had a we had a digital Ava and Beatrice. We scanned them and rigged them and set them all up. And then you know um, part of the exit out of the church in episode four and coming through the stained glass window and crashing crash landing to the ground is is CG doubles. Um, Lilith flying around. Um, when she's just free flying around in the room and then fl zips down, that's all a, 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 a 3D CG Lilith. Um, and then even at the end, 
she she phases in behind um, Ava at one point and like claws at her leg and Ava drops at, in episode 10. That's actually a digital Lilith in there um, where mm. we, we kept her head from one take and put it on a CG body because they wanted to change her action. But if they'd wanted to change it on the day, it would have taken them, you know, them to, to reset and shoot again or whatever. Um, to get all the flying stuff around in the room, it would have taken another day or two to set up more wires. And then whether, whether they would have loved the wire work anyway is questionable. Um, so I think that, that the industry will allow more stories to get told um, because we can do some of this stuff quicker uh, cheaper and, and we can revise it in a way that you just can't, if you're shooting it on set, um, mm. you know, pra practical stuff will, practical stuff will always look a little more grounded, a little more realistic because it's really there and it really mm. happened. But if you, if you, if you can only get the story told because you can do it in visual effects, then you have to make the choice as to whether you can even do the, do the project at all without doing it a certain way. So I think, I think it'll just grow. I think you'll find, more stories, more streaming services, more, more stuff getting done, more productions getting made. Um, because I think it, it, it acts, visual effects acts as a multiplier kind of on, on what you can do on set. Because you can, you can be confident that if you throw a green screen over there, they can, they can put in the building or they can, they can, uh, they can fill in whatever is down that hallway or whatever it is, rather than, than, um, than losing shoot days or losing time moving around. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, I think that, that it's just growth at this point. I think, um, mm -hmm. we're finding it hard to like, we're finding it challenging to, to hire, right. Because there's so much stuff going on. Mm -hmm. You have, you have so much stuff going on with, you know, um, Disney and, um, Amazon prime and, um, Netflix, all these, all the different um, streaming services, HBO is doing stuff. So, you know, there's so much stuff on the go that, that, you know, if you, uh, if you, if you're a Canadian citizen and a BC resident and you want to uh, <laughs> work on stuff, go to our <laughs> careers page, please. <clears throat> but, um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's difficult. It's difficult yeah. to find people because there's so much work. So I think it's just going to grow. I mean, who knows? We might start using, crazy AI stuff for things more. We like, were dabbling with that for trying to like, um, part, part of the work when you're working on footage is you need to, um, um, do rotoscoping of people to be able to put elements behind them. Right. Mm -hmm. So if they're not shot on a green screen and they're just moving around and you need to put the monster behind them or whatever it is, you need to be able to trace the edges so that you can, you can, you can composite them and layer them properly with everything. Um, we've there is some products now where you can kind of like initialize what you want to sort of trace a rotoscope and then have like an ai assisted thing try to like select that thing in the footage all the way through it doesn't work that well yet right and so i think i think there'll be some enabling technologies like that that kind of make it quicker or faster or better but you know that's just that's just the tools getting a little sharper. Um, I think you're still going to need creative people to kind of run them. Mm. Um, I don't think we're we're quite in danger yet of uh, of the what is it the mid journey and and Dali and all these things sort of like coming for our jobs quite yet. You know where <laughs> where somebody just sits back and is like, oh, I'm a I'm a I'm a senior prompt artist, and my job is to tell the AI what to make. I don't I don't think we're quite there yet, but you know maybe Thank good maybe well well to be honest, I think that. <clears throat> that as humans as you said we're creative and i think that you know the, the the work that you get out is spent on the the person doing it and you could say that in every area from actors to directors to you know vi visual effects so um I, I don't know if i would be comfortable with ai because uh, skynet has always scared me ever since i was a kid so who knows yeah but what if skynet imagines you a new warrior nun season three and then you can just well, sit down and and you get the show you want maybe that maybe that, one that, day 
then obviously I'll be biased and I'll be completely behind yeah. Skynet. Um, I will be, <laughs> I'll be promoting them everywhere. Uh, but Michael, you know what? You've been a great guest. It, it's been such an honour to have have you on because, you know, we need to appreciate more people behind the camera that make these shows because you know the actors have got a hard job, but. I think it's magical to 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 speak and meet the people that are responsible for either writing, directing, visual effects. I've got the composer of the score come come, come coming on in the weekend. Um, yeah, cool. Tan, tan, Tangeline. So, you know, it's just fantastic, and I, I, I want to honour you guys by having you on the show because it's just great. It's just fantastic to have, you know, that connect connection. And uh, if we do get a season three, oh, I cannot wait because. Uh, the story needs to continue, and I'm sure the fans are going to get behind it with Save Warrior well, Nun. So I can't. Wait. Well, the f- well, the fun thing I think is that um, yeah, if we get a season three, great, I'm on board. I I, I would be super excited, and you know that would be cool. Um, but our uh, the embassy and and RDF uh, Reality Distortion Field, which is um, the part of Simon's production company we have like a production agreement so that, you know, as they work on new things, we'll be involved. Um, and so, you know, even if it's not warrior none, um, if you're a fan of Simon's work and you follow Simon and in, into whatever he's up to next, you'll probably see us along the ride as well. And so, um, I think that, you know, even if it's, even if it's not this set of characters, um, in this world from warrior none, um if it's if it's if it's simon's sort of inspiration and creativity that that you're excited about and following then you'll then you know you'll see the embassy there as well so that's cool awesome michael thank you so much keep safe and stay super okay take care brian good chat (laughs) 